Hello, Brian. Hello, Greg. Great to see you. Hello, audience, if you're there. Hello, one person. Great to see you. I'm actually tuned that, in too, so that's you. That's <laughs> two, two people. Yeah, look, before we do too much messing around, let me introduce my guest here today. This is uh, my good friend, Greg Primer. Uh, he's a very passionate and professional photographer. Uh, we worked together a few years ago in Canberra and uh, Greg's on holidays in my hometown at the moment so I thought I'd grab him by the scruff and drag him out here and uh, have a chat about uh, passion and patience in photography. Hello Greg. Hello Brian. Great hey. to be here on this very very muggy Friday afternoon in Kiama, in beautiful Kiama. It's so, a lovely day. So if it's Friday and you're not in your office, you haven't pressed the old thank God it's Friday button. No TGIF today, Brian, because I'm not in the office. <laughs> and and it's just every day's every day's wonderful. I don't need to be thinking about work. Although having said that, I do actually work performing duties of things I actually enjoy doing. Which is namely photography. Photography, yeah. And video production. So what is it about photography that gets into your skin, Greg? Oh, I think it's uh, creating something that pleases other people and it will last and stand the test of time. But used to, well, particularly so in the past when it was on film. Because one day someone's going to dig up that box <laughs> and find all of those, and find all those negatives and, and positives and, uh, and look at them. And yeah. think, wow, he, he actually, he did have a bit of an idea about what he was doing. Okay, I've got a few boxes like that as well. And when I dig into them, yes, I do sometimes think I knew what I was doing. But I think another thing that strikes me is the difference. Okay, here's the thing. In the good old, the good old days, when in film, everyone was saying, oh, digital will never catch up with film. Yeah. Yeah, they did. They, they did. did. It did, and it didn't take long, did it? No, it took me a while though to make that switch. But it's funny, isn't it? A little, little tiny Fuji, you know, one megapixel, a happy snap camera that a friend of mine that I borrowed to take pictures to put um, images online on eBay in 1999 to sell images. To sell, sorry, to, sorry, to sell, you know, bits and bobs that I had around the house. I looked at the image out of that little tiny Fuji size of a cigarette packet, happy snap camera, and I went, wow, these things are actually pretty good at creating images. I was very impressed by a little tinny little camera. And now, of course, you can, you know, those two little tinny little cameras are the, the equivalent of the, or if not better than the, uh, the cameras that you have in your phones now. Yeah. It's phones amazing, are, isn't phones it? Phones are pretty good. It's amazing. Yeah. Like, long gone are the Happy Snaps cameras now, I just use my phone. I find that to be more than adequate and about the same, the same sort of quality as those point and shoots. Yeah. When the top, when the need arises. Because, I mean, more often than not, you can't be, you know, you can't carry one of these things around. A big fat SLR with a nice Coke bottle on the front. You don't have that option all of the time. But it's funny though that when you do have that camera on board, and I find that when I have it in the car, or have one in the car, a body and a lens, that I'm more likely to stop and, and capture that that moment that I see, particularly commuting to and from work. I drive past the Brindabellas every day, so I see these magnificent mountains and weather unfolding, but rarely am I in a position to be able to do, do it justice by capturing it on a decent camera. We've got someone from Brazil watching us today. Hello. Beautiful, sun, not so sunny Kiama with a grey sky, but I tell you what, it's cooking. It's hot. It's cooking. Yeah. We are cooking. Uh, cooking, we are up to what? 35, 40 degrees and 90% humidity. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty sticky uh, here today. Pretty warm, pretty warm. G'day, T Bone. T Bone just joined in. Hey, T Bone. Good to see you, T-Bone. Good to see you smiling totally in there, mate. Yeah. Two old blokes sitting on a bench in Kiama, <laughs> looking very suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> sitting on a coffee and talking about photography. Yeah. Well, we've got a nice view here today, Greg. Yeah, it's lovely. And there are little swells coming through. 
Yeah. It is lovely. It went really. There was a massive thunderstorm yesterday afternoon. It's calmed down. It's very sultry and humid now. But uh, later on the Savo, we're going to have another massive storm. So it's building. That humidity is building. It's like the tropics. Hey, audience, if uh, you have any questions for Greg, uh, type them in there. Uh, passion and patience in photography is our theme today. So if you have any questions on that theme, uh, flick them in. If I spot them on the screen here, I'll ask Greg for you. Um, two old strange men sitting on a bench answering questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and our plan today, if you want to stick with us for a while, our plan today is just to have a chat here on the bench for a while. Then we're going to shut down and we're going to go up 20 degrees wherever that person is and that's Fahrenheit. Oh, 20 Fahrenheit. That's, uh, what, that's bloody freezing, isn't it? It is below <laughs> freezing, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can keep that, I'll, I'll stay hot. That's a bit chilly. Yeah, a bit chilly. A bit chilly. I'll never forget, I went out and took pictures with a guy in New York City, in Manhattan. And it was a, it was winter, and we got out, and we were down in this park across the road from his apartment. And I'll never forget that I, I don't think I've experienced anything so cold. It's funny, isn't it? Because my hands would not function. It was so cold. So cold. But... Uh, I don't know what's worse, the freezing or the humidity. Somewhere in between would be nice. Yeah. Especially for the gear. I'm looking very awkward in this picture here, but anyway. You're, not you're to be a bit self critical. You're, you're a bit rigid, Brian. Yeah. You're Speaking of self critical, <laughs> is that important in photography? Being self critical. Yeah. Of the stuff you're doing. Oh, critical of the work, absolutely. I think it's it's vitally important and, and quite and I do a lot of wedding uh, photography. And I'll, and I'll agonise over the shots while I'm doing it. Of course, the client has no idea that I'm sweating brick bullets and <laughs> freaking out, hoping that you know it's their magical day, making sure the pictures work. And I'll shoot, you know, I'll shoot, you know, three or four 32 gigabyte cards on that day and quite often come away from it thinking, well, there are a lot of duds. It just wasn't working or this that particular setup wasn't working. I'm not happy with it. And the best thing to do at that point is to is to put the um, put the images on the hard drive and then forget about them for a few days and give yourself a break from it. Unless you know that you've got one there that really popped, and walk away from it and then come back. Because it's funny how it works is that you think you've had a disaster on the day, but you go back a, a few days after and look at those images and you find that they're actually not that bad at all. In fact, some of them are pretty good. Yeah, that happens all the time. But you are very critical. If you're doing it and earning a dollar from it, you have to be. You have to have that. You have to have that nervous energy going on. Otherwise, you become a little bit too slack and yeah. and it fails. Yeah, the the photographer who isn't fearful on the job or isn't nervous or isn't concerned about what he's doing, yeah. he's the one who doesn't really know what he's doing, is he? Oh, I don't know. I guess it probably can get to a point where you're that relaxed about the whole thing and you know it's all working that you don't sweat it at all. And just say it is what it is. I mean, I'm slowly getting to that point, but it's, I don't think, certainly not a paying job. I don't think there's ever a point where you're, you know, 100% comfortable. I've had, I've had paying jobs where, for, uh, in Hawaii on fashion shoots for a, for a label there in Honolulu where I'd gone out at the crack of dawn wanting to start with that beautiful early morning light and and had the models the first set up and they were standing there and the sun was hitting them and it was you know ideally it would have been the perfect location but but to me it looked flat and awful and, and it just didn't work and I started there was an internal freak out mechanism going on and I was like losing my lolly you know, absolutely calm on the outside, but freaking out on the inside, thinking, uh -huh. no, I don't like these pictures at all. These don't work. And then I thought, well, what do I, what do, I do to get out of this? And I, and I just flipped them around and I put them in with the sun at their backs. So they were totally backlit and then bang, the pictures popped and it started working and I, and I, I got over that hump. And off we went for a full day shoot, all during the day for about, I don't know, for about 15 or 20 setups with different different fashions on these models and the rest of the day rocked but that initial morning the angst was I couldn't yeah I thought I was gonna have an anxiety attack 
until I flip them around. And here's one thing that I learned on wedding photography as well. I got so I, I get out there and I do my first and second and third and fourth wedding and all that sort of stuff and I started with friends of course because I didn't want to be charging people for stuff and I wasn't sure what, what I was doing. So I got over that initial fear, then I started charging and I started to get comfortable with it. And But oh, I found I was pushing myself. The next wedding, okay that one worked and I liked that stuff, now push it to the next little bit. And so by the time you're 30 or 40 weddings into it and you're still pushing yourself the client is super happy because they're getting all these great photos, but I'm never happy because I'm push, trying to push myself. You, you want something different. different. Yeah. You want something different every time. Yeah. yeah. You can and, have. You can have. And you have to be careful of that because if, if you run away with yourself like that too much, you lose sight of the fact that the key photos on the wedding, you know, the kiss and the and the dance and all those kind of things, the drawing, the bouquet, all those. You have to get them, mm. then you play with the other stuff. Yeah, the photo shoots where you have the fun. Yeah, the documentation, the family shots, the family shots, your mum, dad, aunties and uncles, and things—they're all pretty much your, your bog standard. You know, proper flash in there, gripping green, and they all stand there smiling. I mean, that's pretty easy. Yeah, but yeah, don't don't lose lose sight of what the clients actually after and go off on a tangent and then lose them completely. That would be tragic. But yeah, trying to get something different every time is difficult. But it's it's certainly not it's it's certainly achievable. It's not it's not that difficult that you can't achieve it. Every location is different. All the couples are different. You can work them in different ways. And if you have disasters with with personality clashes, which I've got to say never happens. If it does, it's their problem. They're not yours. Then then you, to me once. then you then you then you can still work it and make it happen. It happened to me once, and luckily it was a two-man shoot, a two, me and another guy there. And pre, in pre-planning, I told the bride, I'm going with you, and he's going with the groom. When we got there, I don't know what it was, but like within 10 seconds, I was, oh, I, I, I can't work with I this just person. Can't work with this person. So we, I, I claimed I had a tummy ache or something, and we swapped photographers, and he did a great job, and I had a good time with the boys, but. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's yeah. That's wedding photography. Yeah. A lot of. I don't know whether you guys are into out there in in, um, in uh, Periscope land or actually into looking at commercial jobs, or you're just doing it for your own pleasure. And and where I started was I started with a photographer as a, an assistant for many years on and off for about five years, and wasn't really interested in it per se. I mean, I was interested in photography, but not to that level. I, I certainly didn't want to take on the stress of trying to have to run a business and I was interested in only uh, shooting pictures for myself, beautiful landscapes and cityscapes and the simple things where you know there's no client, there's just you and what you see in your head and what you can create on the day depending on what the weather's like and, and how the location's looking. And that's what I've come back to that after being initially just shooting for myself and not and not having client or any any sort of pressure to perform shoot what I wanted to shoot what I thought looked good I, I, I spent countless dawns and dusks in around Sydney and Sydney Harbour in the uh, in the late 80s that was my that was my passion just shooting landscapes the the, the opera house with the sun uh, pre-dawn behind it with the, the clouds lighting up as they would on a, on a sunset shot, things like that. Just pleasing myself and shooting all transparency and paying for my own film and processing and producing beautiful slides. And then worked again back with that same photographer and we, uh, in 1988, we captured, we captured uh, the big Sydney Harbour fireworks um, to bring in that new year. Then uh, big Big Mo, Missouri, when it came and toured the uh, US warship when it moored in the harbour. It's in it. And we got on board, yep, we got on board, even though the Australian Navy told us there's no way in hell we could get on there to photograph the, the boat. <laughs> we ended up, Steve actually ended up getting a contact with it for the bridge and phoned the, phoned the bridge directly, um, with, you know, circumvented the Australian Navy liaison 
And the guy sent out the Liberty boat to pick us up. He was that excited <laughs> about having us on board. And then uh, we did uh, Expo in Brisbane, and then we did uh, the opening of New Parliament House in Canberra that year. And we produced posters for all of those openings. And uh, that, that was where I really got back into it. Well, as, as a, can you look back and say one thing that sort of put the spark of creativity into you? Oh, probably two. And that was, one of them was doing one minute time exposures with a, with a Ricoh camera and a Hanamex 24mm lens with Pro, Fuji Provia 100 ASA film in the back of it. One minute exposures, looking at the Harbour Bridge, the Opera House behind, we're at McMahon's Point, we're on the other side looking through the bridge and seeing the Opera House behind. One minute exposures at F11, holding it down with the cable release and, and watching, my, watching my watch and doing these one minute exposures. And then looking at the results, the next day we went into the lab the next day and did a quick turnaround. The shot that was uh, Steve was doing with his Mamiya RB67, so he was getting the nice big transparencies and he, we all shot exactly the same things, we were all pointing in exactly the same direction, doing the same exposure with the same, same film stock, different cameras but, but same stock. And his, uh, we pulled them out, we went to the lab, pulled them out, stuck them on the light box and had a look. And one of the ones, a big 24 inch shell had blown up over the bridge and put this magnificent big mushroom um, firework over the top of the bridge and it stuck out like it was in the blackness and it just lifted the bridge and the big uh, curtains that were coming off the bridge. And those two shots, uh, because Steve had a stock library, were immediately submitted to, a uh, call was put out by Time magazine to, to have a look at images for the cover of their next issue of Time magazine and Steve's image uh, got that got that cover and I had exactly the same one so that was something that really it just you know built the awareness of the of the possibilities of, of what I could do you know having a great having a great mentor and tutor there about what I could do with photography and that really kicked it off because I had exactly the same pictures and I, and I, and I spent hours looking at them on the light box with the loop hours and hours. Very excited by that. And also with the opening of Parliament House, for some reason I got, oh, there's uh, porpoises, dolphins oh. down there, oh that was a shark, no they're porpoises. Oh, porpoises, and then just behind the porpoises there is the big school of fish. Wow. Yeah. Breaking the surface, so there's a bit of activity in the ocean there, sorry, we're just uh, observing. We're just getting excited. Just get, I'll just get, hang on, I didn't bring the long yeah. lens. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, with that little interlude, I'm going to re-set up this camera here to re, um, what do you call it? Reframe. Oh, re Keep talking, because I okay, look like a, re -frame. I look like a spare mushroom yeah. on a yeah, spare, barnacle. Yeah, yeah, hanging around like a dick in a shirt sleeve, Brian. Yeah. I think they call that all. And I'll keep an eye on the questions a, and ask you questions. A shag, a shag on a rock. So if people want to ask <laughs> questions. Uh, and maybe if you take your hat off, because I can't see your face with this. Well, hang on, that means we, we share the same hairstyle problem. Right? <laughs> and it's actually really hot under that hat. Yeah. It's cool. And we'll that way a little bit. And I'm going to block the tree that's behind me. Yeah. Okay, is that a good frame? We've got a, we've got a light, we've got a, we've got a light pole light. here, and then we've got a beautiful lighthouse behind. Yeah. And now I'm really going to get the squint on. Maybe I should put my sunnies on. So, yeah, so the, on that second job, I got I got planted on the second tier of the flagpole at New Parliament House in Canberra. So as, the, as there's this big, the, they call it the antenna, and it's this big, the beautiful flagpole that goes up. It has four legs, and then, and then it's joined in the middle with the big the end pole that comes up the middle. And on there is two tiers. And to access it, there's a, there was a, a little cable car that clings onto one of the, the main support legs. Uh, and it's got a gear that drives it, so it's actually gear driven. It's like it's like a roller coaster ride, but it's a single person cage. And they you know, they threw me in the little cage, and, I, and, it, and it creeped up, creeped up, creeped up, and then it went up the vertical of the flagpole, all the way to the top of the second tier. And I and I got out on the second tier myself, and a and then a uh, ABC cameraman, I think, came up, or a wind television cameraman came up. So the two were sitting on the top of the the flagpole for the whole day when the Queen opened Parliament House. So I got to shoot the back of a head for, you know, and the back of everybody's head that stood at the lectern that day, that day for about uh, six or seven hours. G'day, Liberto. Thanks for joining us. Anyone got any questions for Greg? We're talking about passion and patience in photography. 
and many, many years experience. And so yeah. I guess you had to have patience that day because you couldn't go up and then come. <coughs> well, I was, that well, I was also very limited in what I had as far as cameras, lenses and, and what I could shoot and obviously film stock. It wasn't like a, a never ending, you know, a bunch of cards, a bunch of CF cards or SD cards in the slot. So I kept looking over that way. I can't help it. There's dolphins. There's dolphins in and around the rocks. It's, you know, it's pretty, pretty magnificent. So, yeah, I was pretty limited. So the one, the one shot was the wide shot, and it shows because Canberra's are a real, real. There's a lot of symmetry in Canberra. You, there's uh, Kings Avenue going that way, Commonwealth Avenue that way, and then Old Parliament House and Anzac Parade going all the way up to the War Memorial. So it was, it's beautiful, and, and and throngs of people and. Aboriginal protesters and Aboriginal flags, which are great because they actually put a bit of colour into the into the foreground in the forecourt of Parliament House there. So it was a nice picture. I don't think I'm not sure whether they ever published anywhere. I'm pretty sure they might have been because they were also submitted to the stock library that Steve was a member of at the time. And because I was working for him, he you know we just and submitted the images as part of the team. Very um, exorbitant. Yeah. So that's where I really kicked off because I got fabulous results, and I knew that I could actually technically, you know, perform those duties and 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 come up with the with the product at the end, albeit under direction at the time. Uh, what was your worst day ever on the job? Someone from Turkey just joined in. Worst day on the job. Oh, look, I can't tell you. I mean, that would be where you actually didn't come back with what you're supposed to get. And I, I think I can happily say at this point that I've never been in this situation where the job's failed. I've never let it fail. It's never failed. Nothing, nothing's ever failed. It's failed for me personally, if like going out and, you know, thinking that I was going to get a, you know, fabulous picture on a day and it, and it just didn't work out for whatever reason. But, but certainly not in a paying job. There's no, there's no, for me, there's never been uh, the possibility of failure. You always, you come up with the, you come up with the goods at your respective. Do you have a philosophy for that? Like, do you make sure yeah, it's, you the call, it's called the fear of God or the fear, <laughs> the fear of, the fear of failure. Oh, That's do, you, big... do you make sure you get a key <laughs> shot in the bag before you start playing around? Oh, absolutely. And I think, I think the key is with that, with any, like, particularly with any sort of setup jobs is that, you know whether it's a wedding or a commercial job, or you'll know you'll know when you have the shot. It's it's something that that becomes like a sixth sense. And if you're working at a location, and it's and and it's just not working for you in here, you and you're not seeing what you want to see, then you just keep you have to work that job, work the location, work the talent until it pops, until you get one that's acceptable. And nine times out of ten, the acceptability is actually a money shot. It's a it's a good shot. And it's not it's not just something ordinary. You know you've got it once you've got it. Absolutely, and that's that's the key too. It's not to overwork that particular location. Is know that if and bang you've got it in the can. Check focus. Make sure everything's okay. And then stop and move on to the next one because you know you have it. Not just continue and think you can do better. There is a, there is a you know it does it does reach a, a pinnacle. And you, and you climb and you climb and you climb and you reach the top and then off, quite often if you keep pushing it you just go over the other side and down again. Um, without necessarily saying who you work for at the moment, what describe your job? Oh, the job's very wide and varied in that uh, it, the basic stuff can be a grip and grin, you know, the old grip hold the handshake and, and a smile to the camera um, through to, to advertising material and promotional material used for online typically online marketing and, and print so they can, it's very very varied in its in its um, in its demand so it's a bit of everything really so here's where I'm going with this question mm -hmm. photography is a passion but it's also a job is it passionate every day, or is there a lot of mundane in it? Oh, look, there's a fair bit of mundane in it, but but 
being successful as a photographer, one of the one of the key elements that you must have is the ability to deal with people and and have a laugh and immediately build a relationship and and have a good time. I think it's not, you know if if you show up to a job and you stand there like a stunned mullet and you don't have fun with the people you're working with, then you'll never get called back again. You'll never get, you can go the other way and be a little bit too outrageous, but that, that's where I tend to sort of populate on the, the little bit more of the pushing of the envelope um, by having fun on the job. I think it's vital, vital to keep the, keep the energy up. So and I, I, I don't know how you survived it. I we really pick it. honestly don't have your personality. No, but you had something else in that I know that the the big cheese at the time when Brian was working there as the photographer really loved him, thought he was the best thing ever, and just constantly got him in. And it's, you know, and that's the big the big boss, really big boss, love Brian because Brian's personality appealed to him. He was very he was an introvert. <laughs> the big boss was an introvert and very measured in the way he he uh you know presented to to the public and and to his subordinates where i was completely opposite in fact even to the point where he would tell me to shut up because i was wearing a loud shirt <laughs> i mean go figure and i'd have to leave the room because he couldn't stand me in the room with that and that's with saying nothing because i was I, he just you know i guess i just oozed loudness <laughs> And on casual Fridays wearing a big Hawaiian, a big loud Hawaiian shirt. Although I've got to admit the one that he did have a go at wasn't a loud Hawaiian shirt. That was pretty pretty conservative in my in, in my book. Mm. So, so, so I guess we worked well as a team then because it was yin and yang and Absolutely. Yeah, and I think and it's funny how that works because the guy that's in there now, there's another guy in there, and we do uh, we don't have an official photographer as such anymore we we share the duties between three of us that can actually take pictures and there's only two of us that i think do it any 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 a really good job or any any good and that would be myself and another guy and we we're good at what we do and it, because we're passionate about what we do and we aren't we don't just do it in our day job we do it i do it i do it as a day job i do it as secondary employment and i do it as as a passion i do it because i want to do it for me so I'm lucky like that because I get to enjoy it. Uh, the, the doldrums of, of doing something pretty pedestrian at, at work is outweighed by the fact that I know that if, if some beautiful weather event happens in the afternoon on my way home, I can, I, can, I can race home and get my cameras and go out and take something for me. And for me these days, it, it is weather and landscapes. And family. Yeah, I'll do the family. Yeah. Well, I'm a bit the same too, but one thing I've noticed, and I bet you'll agree with me, you've got thousands and thousands of photos you've taken, yep. and then the wife asks you to print a canvas to put on a wall. No, she doesn't like. She doesn't want to print canvases on the wall. I go out and get things printed, and she goes, you're not putting that on the wall. <laughs> and it's like, you know, something absolutely stunning, and yet no, it doesn't fit with the decor, or no, it does, it's unsuitable. I've only got one picture hanging in the, in the house of a, of a landscape that I did down way down on the south coast. And it's really quite simple. It's a simple picture. It's something you see every day. But the colours, the colours are just beautiful. And it was shot, it was shot actually, it wasn't a late afternoon, it wasn't anything special. It was just done because it looked good at the time with the long lens. I suppose the old saying, Beauties in the eye of the beholder is true as well because I, I've I've, print, I've printed photos on canvas without asking permission and uh -oh. I'll find somewhere to hang them. Yeah. And she, she's printed a photo from her iPhone that I really don't like, but she likes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Look, and that's it. I mean, as far as as far as photography is a rule, it's not necessarily the gear that you have. It's not. You don't have to have a million dollar camera with a with a you know a ten thousand dollar lens on it. You don't. That's not that's not what it's about. It's about it's about what you convey in the image, and it's about it's about what's happening in that image. And it could be the worst camera in the world, but if it tells a, a wonderful story, uh, then it you know that's it. It's sold. 
it's sold. And often you'll take pictures and uh, and you'll think, eh, I'd really don't like that much. It's that's not that's not singing to me. It's not technically brilliant or anything. And and another person will look at it and say, wow, that is just phenomenal. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 all in interpretation. Uh, People will get different meanings out of different images. Certainly, if there's people involved, it'll have a different meaning. And it could be the worst picture in the world technically, but it, it has a huge amount of, of value and sentiment for a particular person. So, you, you mentioned technically there. So, to you and maybe to me, technique is sort of like reading. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. What, yeah, what we're extra gonna... do you, does someone like you bring to a photo? We're going to push it. Look, I don't know, isn't it funny? Because a lot of there are people that go out and get fine art degrees in photography and still can't frame a picture to save themselves. And they struggle. They struggle with, with composing. You know, there's there's something about you know, looking through the looking through the ground glass, looking through that viewfinder and that mirror down through that Coke bottle. And it's about immersing yourself in that in that that vision through the lens. And then looking at something, just immersing yourself in it, and then looking and looking and looking, and just finding that point where all of the elements that are in there to frame a nice picture are, are present, and then you pop the shutter, or you'll pop the shutter multiple times, knowing that one of those will, will be the right, will have the right content, and then and then with a with a larger megapixel camera, you can then crop it to a point where you know, you have that you have that ability to crop to just a to get it to exactly where you want it to be and I don't know I like to shoot my stuff within the camera I don't like to overly crop it outside because I want as much image area and pixels in that image as possible but sometimes you can't because your lens, lens isn't long enough and certainly if it's not wide enough you can shoot a panorama you can shoot two or three and stitch them together and in Photoshop these days it's a piece of cake and they look fabulous panoramas are just again another thing if it's not wide enough, shoot shoot more than one picture, and just overlap it by fifty percent. Simple, keep it level. And some cameras will even do that in the camera for you. They do. iPhones iPhones do it with an arrow that lines up over the, for a panorama. It lines up with an arrow, so all you have to do is keep it steady. Yeah. And I did one the other day. We actually pointed it at the sky, but I kept it steady, and I got this beautiful, you know, mammatus cloud formation over the back of the beach because it looked really good. <laughs> I think knowing what looks good too helps if you're going to do it for a job you've got to know what looks good you can't just go off and shoot I mean everybody's got a camera these days and everybody's got a nice camera and they it's so accessible these days to everybody but there are still I guess probably relatively the same amount of photographers actually making a living out of it it's it's again it's that combination of taking on the stress of running a business Having the personality to be able to deal with anybody at any time and build a relationship instantly. And that goes for a lot of other um, professions too. If it's a choice, ir irrespective of, the, if, if you're a good photographer and there's this other guy that's a fantastic photographer, you know, according to the, 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 the um, the industry and all and all the punters, but you know this guy's fabulous. This guy, this guy's okay. It, if this guy gets the job, that's okay. It's because of his personality. It's not because it's not because he takes a better picture. It's because he can get along with people and actually you know have that relationship. And I think that's vital. That's one of the most important things because the guy that can take the you know the uber you know spectacular pictures is probably a real real you know difficult person to work with. <laughs> Okay, now here, here's the thing, and you've just something you just said made me think that you like a certain style of photo, or you, you think you think a particular photo is beautiful. How does that affect the photo that you take when you're not the customer? In other words, if you're out on a job in a field one day and you take a beautiful panoramic whatever and then the next day you're in at work and you need to do a grab and grin 
Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Does, yeah. does it clash with you personally? Does it, you know, artistically, does it clash? Not at all. No, no, because that's that's the beauty of it. It's um, there, there's a, there's documentation, there's art, and I think there's and there, and there, everything in between. That's that's the beauty of, of being, and certainly doing it for a living. It's not not all two days are going to be the same because if you. You know, I'm sure it'll be everyone's dream to just to be able to put in, jump in a camper van and drive around Australia and just take go to the most magnificent locations and be able to stay there for a week until the light was right. I mean, we'd all love that, wouldn't we? But also, by the same token, if you're doing it for a living, you've got to be able to, you know, make it work on the day too, and and still come home with something that's acceptable. I mean, I get I get thrown jobs all the time where I've got to shoot pictures of motor vehicles with people, and they say we're doing it at like 10:30 in the morning. <laughs> I say to them, you know, it's the worst time of the day you could possibly be thinking about taking a picture. It's awful. The, the sun's at a really bad angle. It's exceedingly intense. It's a, you know, the shadows are awful. Um, but you have to make it work. And you've, that's where a little bit of post, you know, a little bit of artistic license in post comes in for me. Do it in post. And but always make the picture work. And I've, you know, I've done that on several occasions. And if they say we can only do it at 10 o'clock in the morning, then you just have to do it at 10 o'clock in the morning and make it work. A, a little bit of experience comes in handy there. Okay, you, you mentioned going out for a week in a camper van and waiting for the light to be just so. That's my dream. Yeah, that comes down to the patience. What, what do you have to say about patience? And oh. <laughs> it's a long time coming. A long and time do you coming. Have any of it because you're I don't. No, I'm a yesterday. bit of a. I'm a bit hyperactive. But when it comes to, I think that sort of discipline appears magically when you when when you know that you have to wait for the shot. It's like waiting, like what, doing doing a sunset shoot where you know after a while you get to know that sun's looking bang hits the clouds. It's just absolutely fabulous. You think great, great. How could it possibly get any better than this? And it actually does. It gets better. It gets better, but you have to wait for it. You have to just sit there until it's gone, because it, it goes in phases. Patience, waiting for the light. Well, yes, you have to wait for it. If it's a if it's the location's wor if worthy of a, of a beautiful shot, then why wouldn't you have the patience to do it? You'd go back. You'd go back ten times because you, you've seen it and you know it, you know it looks particularly good with a certain type of light. You can see it. You can visualise what it would look like with a certain type of light. You just then you just wait there. You wait there until it happens, where you keep going back. And I've I've done that. Everyone's done that as part of a landscape. Uh, you know, taking landscape pictures, waiting, going back, going back again and again, knowing knowing that that location with the right light is going to absolutely pop. Go back. Wait for it on the day if you can, but we're not always able to do that. Go back. Go back another day. Keep going back until you get what you want. I certainly did that with the Opera House. When I asked you to come and do this periscope with me, the reason I asked you is because you and I went for a walk one day in a fairly dreary sort of atmosphere in a location. Yeah, yeah, it was good. And it was, it was just that <laughs> feeling that two photographers together understood each other and understood patience and passion yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Well, I think it was just pleasant to be there though, Brian. In a non-gay kind of way. Yeah, <laughs> in a non-gay type. But it's just pleasant to be there in a wonderful location knowing that if that if that, if that that light pops through the cloud at, the, at a particular time, it's going to look spectacular and there's, and there's not just one area that's going to look spectacular. The whole thing looks fabulous. Whether you're looking at the water side or the inside, or you know, as Brian did, as we did, we we looked at reflections in rock pools, and and it was flat, and the sun the sun was going down, and it was. We got some great pictures. We got some great pictures that day. Nine tenths of good landscape photography is, you know, being in a good location. The other ten percent, the other ten percent is, you know, knowing what you're doing to make the camera work. But being there, being there is vital. Making making that effort to go somewhere special. Well, would you also say that even if you're not in some, that somewhere in inverted commas air quotes special, that you can still find beauty in? Oh, stuff? absolutely. That's where you turn. You know, this it, it's not just it's not just you know the vista. It's it's looking down at the grass or looking at something close up or looking between the rocks. 
or looking at something in a macro way, you know, or looking down there and seeing a half smoke spliff lying on the ground there. It's it's looking at all of the environment, not just the big picture. And if you struggle, then look somewhere else. Just turn your head, turn around, go turn 360 degrees and pick a spot that looks good. Because even even in the most mundane locations, there's always something that looks good. It all depends on how you approach it. Put the camera to the ground, have a foreground of grass and point it up at ground level. You know, bang, there you've got an interesting thing. You've got a foreground, you've got a middle ground, and you've got the, the background. It's like telling a story, isn't it? There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Everywhere's got a story. Um, that pole's sticking out of your head. <laughs> um, My favourite Martian. And also, when I was thinking about today, this morning I was thinking about what we were going to do, and it sort of struck me that photography was kind of like fishing. Because it's not about what you catch often, it's about the journey. The journey and the destination. <laughs> yep. And coming back with a memory, even if you don't get the photo that you're after. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a lot to do with that. It's a lot. It's a lot to do with just experiencing, immersing yourself in your location as you would through the through the ground glass of your camera, through the looking through the mirror. And that's the passion side of things. Or, or for those those people with the mirrorless cameras, I feel sorry for you because you know looking at an LCD screen out in a beautiful location, it to me is not very inspiring. <laughs> looking through a lens, however, is a completely different story. Does that make you a dinosaur these days? No, not at all. No, mirrorless cameras will never take. Never take over from SLRs, I guess, you know, yeah, okay, famous Isn't last words. They no, they will, no, form. because, no, because a lot of, a lot of, a lot of that passion is, is involved or comes from looking down through the lens, immersing yourself in the ground glass. I don't know if it's ground glass anymore, but it's <laughs> immersing yourself in that viewfinder, looking through the actual lens and just thinking, well, that's, this is my view at a particular, you know, particular focal length, that, that's my view, I'm going to have to make that work. I mean, I look at the, the grass behind Brian there, or the grass off the hill here. It's just a massive expanse of grass, ocean and then sky. I mean, if that didn't work for me as a, as a because it was too grey or whatever on the day, I'd, I'd shoot just the right, the close up of the flowers on the grass and then let everything else go out of focus. And there's your, there's your background with a beautiful coloured foreground. Even though what we were witnessing here earlier, you couldn't see unfortunately, it was just fabulous. Dolphins swimming past in a big school of fish. In fact, the fish are still there, Brian. Well, that brings up my next point then. We were gonna split this into two sections and sit here and have a chat and then go for a walk and see what we come well, up with. We could go just somewhere local here. I don't think we need to go down to the quarry because that's a bit of, that's a bit of a journey. Yeah. There's actually quite quite a nice area just here with these rocks. So yeah, as long as the uh, phone reception holds up for us. We the phone reception yeah. holds up, and the good thing is there's some actual nice clouds going on too. It's the calm before the storm. <laughs> so listen, audience, um, <laughs> if you uh, if you want to stick around for a while, we're going to shut down just now and. Uh, uh, we'll come back in say about 15 or 20 minutes when we've set up in a new location so uh yeah check us out again in about 15 20 minutes <laughs> Ciao.